Thanks for joining us on another episode of Distant Replay. Today, we're going back to documentary recaps. We watched A Football Life, Reggie White, and Jerome Brown. We'll tell you why we picked this episode out, but I thought it was very interesting. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot from this episode going back on two great NFL players that left us way too early. And I thought this documentary really captured their relationship, their career, and their passing. I thought it was a really good documentary. We're going to talk all about it today on this episode. This is Distant Replay. All right, it's time to go back to another documentary, sports documentary. Go back, we watch it, and uh, give you some thoughts. Recap it and go through what was talked about. Today, we're doing a football life. It is Jerome Brown and Reggie White. This is actually the second, I guess the third, technically the third, because they did a two-part Bill Belichick to kick off season one of A Football Life. But this was the second feature of A Football Life, which has now gone nine seasons and 116 episodes. This thing debuted back in September, uh, September 29th of 2011. Hard to believe almost 10 years ago this air, but this is our focus today on Distant Replay. I am Ben George. He is Mike Noto. Mike, doc, we're going more documentaries now. We're going to try to make this as a part of the rotation in our, our episodes and our content. Why did you pick this one out? First of all, I love these uh, football life episodes, okay? So I'm a huge fan of the series in general. Like you mentioned, it's gone like nine or 10 seasons already. This was one that always stuck out to me. There's some of these that I think are a little bit better than others because they delve into more than just the person's career. Um, and I just thought the relationship between Reggie White and Jerome Brown was so unique that, you know, it was one that our listeners would like. How many of these have you watched, do you think? hundred? There's 100, I mentioned 116 episodes. I've probably watched between 50 and 75, if wow. I guess. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, I love it. You know, because you can knock them. Again, a lot of them are in the full length on YouTube. Right. They're not that long, typically. Some of the longer ones, maybe like an hour and a half, but typically it's an hour to an hour and a half with commercials, right? Yeah. So you can knock them out quick. And, you know, as we, as you guys know, if you listen to this channel, you know, listen to the podcast, we really, really like football, you know? So, right. I, I, we're, and we're junkies for sports history. You know what I mean? So when you combine those, um, they're interesting watches. They delve a little bit more into like, this guy was a good player, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and this one even more so because of how these guys' lives ended up going. Yeah, the tagline for a football life is a look inside the untold stories of NFL icons. And today we've got two, probably one much more well-known than the other, Reggie White, Jerome Brown. That is our focus today. We'll go through the documentary. I'll remind you too. We have our website, uh, distantreplaypodcast.com. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram, but also our YouTube channel as well. Nearing 2,000 subscribers, which we appreciate. Spread the word. Hit subscribe if you haven't. We do appreciate all the support there and all the re recommendations you send us. Uh, we try to go through those and take those into account, put them on our list for future episodes as well. So I think this, this documentary, I did like it, first of all. Second, I didn't really know much about Jerome Brown and... I don't know much about these Eagles teams either, right? I, I'm a fan, right, of football. I'm a fan, you know, of sports in general. But there's some, you know, some really niche teams. And this, I'm not saying this is a niche team in Philadelphia. I'm just saying, like, there's some teams that really kind of carved out a piece of history that just the general sports fan's not going to know about. And these Eagles teams during this period would, I think, kind of fall in that category. Yeah, they're kind of like cult favorite teams. So that's how I equate them. So that these, these Eagles teams that these two were a major part of, you know, led the years they were led by Buddy Ryan, who, you know, Rex, Rex and Rob Ryan's father, huge personality. If you want to know where Rex and, and Rob get it from, <laughs> you know, just watch a couple Buddy Ryan videos, you know? Yeah. So you had a team led by Buddy Ryan coming off of being the defensive coordinator for those great Bears teams. You had personalities on the Eagles, like Reggie White and a Jerome Brown and a Randall Cunningham leading the offense. And these guys kind of all just perfectly converged together in a division at the time that was awesome. So that this time period, you have the Giants and Redskins winning Super Bowls. You have the, the Eagles in a three-year span winning 31, 31 regular season games and were ascending into the Cowboys years of you know troy aikman jimmy johnson so we're like right we're bridging those two gaps in the nfc east history wise and you have this like i said colt team led by these two huge personalities on the defensive line 
Yeah, and you're probably wondering, if you don't know a lot about these teams and don't know a lot about Jerome Brown, which is kind of where I was, you're probably wondering, well, why do you have these two guys together for one documentary? Well, that's what you learn over the course of 45 minutes without commercials in this video, in this documentary. These two guys were dominant forces along the defensive line. They were guys that kind of made a connection early in their careers through a summer camp and then ended up on the same team. And they had very different personalities, which I think made this a very unique relationship, but also worked really well together. Yeah, so both big personalities, but they just went about their lives in different ways. And I think a lot had to do with the fact that Jerome Brown being a little younger, Reggie White being a little more established with, you know, with the family, the wife and kids, Jerome Brown being the young bachelor who wanted to sort of live hard. But in the end, a lot of respect for each other. Jerome Brown looked to Reggie White as a mentor. And on the field, where it mattered most, I mean, these two were both all pro-level players. We know Reggie White went on to the Hall of Fame career, but Jerome Brown, in his short career, two-time All-Pro. Right. That's you, you don't really realize that if you don't if you weren't following NFL and you weren't following the Eagles at that time period. And you know now we're 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 thirty years away from his his first All Pro season, Mike. So we're pretty far removed at this time. And even in you know 2011 when this debuted this documentary, you know you're you're still a good twenty years out. So still close, but you know you're starting to kind of that memory is starting to fade a little bit, which is why it's good to to kind of go back to this, but. You know, what I thought was pretty cool is just kind of learning more about Jerome Brown because I think more people than would realize actually kind of know who this guy is because if you've seen any of the old Miami videos, right, those teams in the 80s that had that swagger and they've been well documented now on some, uh, I think a 30 for 30 captured it well, but these guys showed up in fatigues at press conferences and, you know, kind of created the aura that's around the Hurricanes now. Jerome Brown was right in the thick of that. Jerome Brown is front and center. So when I think about those era Miami teams, I think of Michael Irvin on the offensive side of the ball, and I think of Jerome Brown on the defensive side of the ball. When I right. think of Miami football from back in that era, which is when I started to follow them uh, and become a fan, as you know, if you listen to, uh, to the podcast, these are the two guys I think of. And they're guys that quite simply talked a big game, but backed it up. I thought you were going to say Vinny Tessaverde was your offensive guy. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, I, I, I'm talking more from a like, right. like a Miami personality, yeah, like yeah, yeah. what they would become and what they're known for. Vinny was a Vinny was a good college. Vinny was a good pro quarterback too, but good yeah. college quarterback. And the video of them coming off the plane in the army fatigues um, before <laughs> they played Penn State, where you have Jerome Brown and then right behind him, Vinny Testaverde. It's, Vinny looked pretty pretty slick in those army fatigues. You know, the, one of the lines from this documentary that Brown said at the at one of the press conference, I guess, before that game, I, I don't know. I don't remember all the backstory. I guess maybe they were not at the same press conference didn't, or didn't show up for an event or something like that. It was actually at a dinner. It was actually at a dinner, Ben. So okay. it was like at the the, the dinner for the uh, before the Fiesta Bowl. They have both teams together that come for a dinner. Yeah. And his point was he got on a microphone dressed in his army fatigue. Because they didn't show said, up, right? No, they were there. They were at the dinner right before it started. But just not interacting and, very much. And they basically said, like, you know, uh, he used the comparison of, <laughs> you know, basically the two people that are about to, the two groups that are about to go to war have dinner t the night before together. You yeah. know what I mean? And they, he basically said that, and the whole Miami team walked out of the dinner. And he used the comparison. I think he used the comparison of Pearl Harbor, I believe. Yeah, basically like the, the Japanese, you know, have dinner with the Americans the night before Pearl Harbor. Maybe not the best example, but yeah. still, still <laughs> yeah. like that's – he did it on a microphone in front of the dinner yeah. right before it started. And the whole Miami team got up and walked out. It's just incredible. I mean, could you imagine that today? That would be – I mean, you cancel Jerome Brown immediately, but – that's just that was the era, and that was Miami football, and that's what they were all about. But I guess we could probably hit on how they first met because I thought that was interesting, just going back to the history of these two guys, the fact that they ended up with each other on the same team. But was it a camp at Tennessee they ended up first meeting? Yeah, these guys meet at a summer camp in the late 70s at Tennessee when Reggie White was a player at the University of Tennessee and Brown was attending the camp. Yeah, um, crazy. And the documentary goes into kind of the paths they would take after that summer camp and how they would converge together again with the Eagles, you know? So one thing I forgot about, Ben, is how Reggie White initially signed with the USFL out of yeah. college. 
yeah. which I had forgotten. I knew that, but I just had forgotten. And how it took the owner of the Eagles, Norman Brayman, a million dollars, you know, to get him to pry him away, to he had to pay the Memphis Showboats, the team, a million dollars to get him to Philly. And how how weird was it the fact that Reggie White wore number ninety one in his first season with the Eagles? Yeah, that is wild. Yeah, you equate him with being you know number ninety two. I mean, mm-hmm. I think he's synonymous with that number now. Yeah, that and is then his you, number. Yeah, and then you get into Jerome Brown's story when he went to Miami. I thought the the story Troy Aikman told when he played for Oklahoma, and how Jerome Brown basically injured him. Yeah, uh, when he was the quarterback for Oklahoma which led Troy, Troy Aikman to miss a lot of time that season, then led to Troy Aikman transferring to UCLA and the parallels there where then, you know, that leads eventually to Troy Aikman down the road of becoming the first overall draft pick to the Cowboys and having to deal with Jerome Brown and Reggie White when he <laughs> becomes quarterback of the Cowboys. So, I don't think I remember Troy Aikman played at Oklahoma. I, I don't know if that's common to think about because you think of him as a UCLA guy, right? But I saw those highlights with Oklahoma and I like it – it was like brand new information to me. Well, I think because he didn't he didn't last long there because he got injured. Yeah, you know by by Jerome Brown. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, crazy. that's probably that's probably the main that it, you know. And and Aiken did a good job kind of telling that story there um, about the impact Jerome Brown had on him. There was a couple quarterbacks that were in this episode, yeah. most notably Troy Aikman and Phil Sims, and that was a funny scene when right before it's it's obvious I guess the Eagles are going to draft Jerome Brown. Mm-hmm. And Parcells telling Sims, <laughs> our life has changed, you yeah. know, because now you're going to have, and specifically Sims' life was about to change because now you have to deal not only with Reggie White on the def- defensive line, but you also have to deal with Jerome Brown and you have to deal with the Buddy Ryan system with them blitzing from everywhere. Um, that was a Sims was Sims was good in this. He was in a couple scenes, but he was good in it. Yeah, it was a good era for quarterbacks in that division too. So. These guys definitely had an impact. And, you know, he was drafted to the Eagles. You know, I thought it was pretty cool to see how Reggie White kind of took him under his wing, you know. And and that, and that I love Reggie. And I think, you know, with this documentary, you kind of get a better sense of who – well, you get a good sense of who Reggie is, not a better sense because it's not really, really focused on him. But you get a sense of who he is as a guy that, you know, is a, is a, is a man of God, and that's kind of the way he lives his life. But, you know, he doesn't shun a guy like this that's, you know, very animated, kind of does things his own way, kind of lives kind of a crazy and wild life you know, brings him in and tries to teach him, tries to help him, tries to lift him up on the football field and make him a better player. And when he does that too, it, in, you know, in turn helps Reggie White become a much better player too. And the guy even elevates his game because of Brown. This is what I thought was great about their relationship. They live their lives a different way, but they both showed each other a tremendous amount of respect when they interacted with each other. You know, it was like, hey, I respect you. You respect me. Reggie White giving him sort of some guidance on maybe how he could tinker things and do things a little bit better. And the level of respect they kept with each other throughout all of that. Because not many young guys in Jerome Brown's situation, you know, take to criticism, constructive criticism very well. You know, Um, and I thought that was a unique part of the relationship. Reggie White, I mean, the Minister of Defense, great nickname. Yeah, tremendous. That's like a Mount Rushmore nickname, Minister of Defense. And I thought that you hit on a very good point, Ben. Mike Golick, who's another member of this defensive line with the Eagles during this era, who obviously has gone on to, you know, become a, a, um, you know, radio host with ESPN for years and years, brought up a good point with Reggie White, how he lived his life a certain way, being very religious, but he never looked down on people or tried to change people to get them to think like he, like he thought. Yeah. You know, and I, I thought that's, that's a special person right there that can live their life that way, in my opinion. Yeah, you have so many people that, that judge you either way, right? No matter how you live. Like, they look at you as if you're not doing it my way, you're doing it the wrong way, right? And, and you know, White definitely could have done that, but that's not the type of person he was, and you saw that here. I mean, and I think because these guys were pretty similar. I mean, just how animated they were, the the huge personalities both these guys possess. They both could just talk forever, right? I mean, these guys were – were very much more closely related than you would think. And that's why they connected so much. But, you know, you look at these teams and and they both were so good in the late eighties, early nineties, Brown wins, I guess the pro, all pro in the 90, 91 season. And, you know, but all, but all this, while this is happening, you know, they're documenting kind of the things that he would do off the field and like taking a motorcycle in the parking lot 
at the stadium and going like 80 through the parking lot. Like, just lived on the edge, and that's just kind of who he was, right? It's one of those people where, I think, I don't remember who said it, maybe it was Reggie White's wife or... I don't remember who said it, but like some people just take longer to grow up, right? They just kind of, they have that kind of childlike energy and curiosity and kind of fearlessness. And that's what Brown had. Yeah. And and there was some good insight to Jerome Brown, how he was kind of living his life during these segments. I thought his dad gave some good perspective, Jerome Brown's dad, along with Jeff Fisher. I thought some of the stories he told about Reggie White and Jerome Brown were very, Jeff Fisher is good in these spots. I've heard him on podcasts. He's on Pardon My Take a lot with uh, Big Cat and uh, PFT. And he's actually really good in these spots. Um, and I thought the way he w- described with Jerome Brown driving through the parking lot, like you mentioned, and how he would cringe when he did it. And just him telling some funny stories about White and Brown, I thought was unique. And look, this team wins 31 games in three years. This is a team that's winning on the field. And you know, it's all about them just trying to keep Jerome Brown on the straight and narrow so he could reach his full potential. Yeah, but you know, the documentary obviously is about two things. These guys both getting together and connecting on the field and becoming a dominant force for the Eagles, but also two guys that left us way too early, right, way too young. And for Brown, he died at 27, much like the way he lived his life. He was speeding in a vehicle with his 12-year-old uh, nephew, I believe, and they flipped it. Top was down, I think. So, you know, almost, I guess, died immediately upon impact driving a Corvette. And, you know, just a real sad story. But what, what really kind of caught me during this is the fact that it's a different age, right? New, news doesn't travel like it does now. It's, you know, you rely on word of mouth or a newspaper that comes out right once a day. So, you know, it takes a little bit of time for, for something like this to actually get around to people. And, and Reggie White was actually at, at the stadium for a Billy Graham event, right? And he was set to speak there. And he found out right before going on stage and comes up and says, look, I had a, a, something prepared, but I, you know, this is going to be a completely different speech because I just found out I lost a really good friend of mine, Jerome Brown. And the reaction is unlike anything you'll ever hear ever again. I mean, that, that, that crowd in Philadelphia that finds out that this great Eagle has passed away at 27 and you just hear this gasp and this audible, like, you know, thousands and thousands of people in the stadium. You'll never hear something like that again, that reaction, because everything we find, we find Mike on our own, on the phone or with maybe one or two people, you're never going to have these huge events where news is broken like that. And that, that I thought that scene was remarkable. That was remarkable. Now picture what Ben's talking about here. You have a sold out veteran stadium in Philadelphia. Reggie White is getting up there at, at a Billy Graham, you know, religious type event. And you think he's about to give, you know, a sermon of some point of some kind about who knows what, you know, whatever he picks for the topic. And he stuns the crowd with this news. And man, it's been a while since I've heard a gasp across a crowd like that. Yeah. Um, and that just, that took you back. And what I didn't realize about that incident, Ben, the car accident, I knew he knew he had died in a car accident. I did not know that his nephew was involved as well. Yeah. Sad. So that, that got me. And when his dad was talking, basically losing his grandson and his son, yeah. that was tough. That was one of the tougher parts of, the, of this documentary. Um, I, cause I, cause it took me by surprise and, you know, and, and, and when they take you take it a step further and go to the funeral for for Jerome Brown, when like uh, the whole thing where Jerome Brown didn't like to wear ties, mm-hmm. so they all the whole team basically took their ties off and put them on his coffin. Those yeah. things, I mean, you know, it's what makes these documentaries good. But those are moments that are just you know they stay etched in your mind. Yep, and it had a lasting impact on Reggie White and. And on this Eagles team, I mean, obviously it changed kind of the trajectory of Reggie White and Philadelphia, this 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 franchise. You know, they they played for him, dedicated the season to him, uh, retired his number in 1992 in a pregame ceremony, the number 99, you know, kind of devoted that entire year for him. And, you know, even got to the playoffs and won a game. But what I didn't really realize is just kind of how – I mean, everything changed for Reggie White at this point. And, and I don't, I mean, I, I knew that he ended up not finishing as an Eagle, right? Had a, had a great time with the Packers and, and won a championship there. But I, I guess I just kind of forgot how that happened and why that happened. But it's crazy to me that 
the Eagles, after all this occurred, just pretty much let him walk. Yeah, I had lived so I so I, we've gone into this before how I, I grew up in New Jersey, but so I grew up right in between New York City and Philadelphia. So I this was a huge deal when they let him go. Like when they, when they were when he was becoming a free agent and they were kind of lukewarm about re-signing him yeah. and how this all went down was a huge story. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh I mean just think to that point in, in Eagles history, he's one of the top defensive players in their you know, they have this whole little era here that I mentioned where, you know, it, it's led by the defense, led by Buddy Ryan. Even when Kotite became the coach in the 91 season, this team's still led by their defense. And now you have the leader of that defense, a future Hall of Famer, still with productive years left. And you're kind of casting him aside is what the feeling was. And it was big news. And he ends, he ends up leaving for Green Bay, as we all know. He ends up winning a Super Bowl with Green Bay. He retires as the NFL all-time sack leader. But how he left Philadelphia was troubling, to say the least, for Eagles fans. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really realize that. That's something that I learned in this documentary. And I'm sure, you know, like you and anybody in that area definitely knows that story and how it all turned out. But it's just remarkable when you kind of have it with this backdrop of everything that happened the year prior. And then it's just, you know, he, he exits and, and all of a sudden your franchise looks completely different. And just a it, matter of a year it changed everything. Especially Ben, when you when you know that the, the the year the year after they lose Jerome Brown, they retire his number, like you mentioned, they go eleven and five, win win a win a playoff game, finally get over that hump. They lose to the now having ascended Cowboys in the yep. divisional round, who would go on to win the Super Bowl that year. But still, they're coming off a good season. You know, it's not like the team was in a rebuild mode. Right. Exactly. And, you know, Reggie White would go on, play six seasons with the Packers, and then uh, would actually play one year with Carolina. I think a lot of people might forget about that. Came out and started 16 games after one year in retirement, came back and played for one season, and uh, and that was in 2000. He retired after that season and, you know, made that area his home, was living outside of Charlotte. And, you know, you had his tragic passing too, where his wife tells a story here where, you know, he woke up kind of gasping in, in the morning and, you know, she thought it was a sleep apnea thing, wasn't too sure. And then, you know, knew all of a sudden that he couldn't really breathe, called 911 and he was pronounced dead shortly thereafter. I mean, just another tragic ending, that, but kind of another, another parallel between these two guys, you know, not only the, their careers, but in their personalities, but also, you know, they both left us so early and, and, and I guess I'd kind of forgotten too this just how young Reggie White was. Like he kind of grew up and he was kind of, you know, he was already in, in the NFL playing kind of when I started following. And he seemed like an older guy to me, right? As a really, really young kid. So I didn't really think about it now. But you look back at only 43 years old when he passed away and, you know, only four years out of the NFL. It just, man, this is a it's a pretty, pretty heavy documentary. Yeah, definitely heavy for sure. Especially as we get to like to the age where we're approaching 40. You know what I mean? Like you think like, wow, 43. Right. You know? Seems it's young. Crazy. I mean, it, you know, it, yeah. it, you, everybody laughing that's younger is like, yeah, you're, you're old. But no, you'll see like as you get older, like the, the age truly is a number. And you don't like I don't feel it. I'm about to turn 40. I don't feel it. Right. I don't feel much different than I did when I was 30. Right. Maybe yeah. a few things hurt here and there. But well, but it's still like you still have that that uh, energy for life that you still had and it doesn't feel that way. So yeah, when you, when you see that number compared to where you are in life, yeah, it does open your eyes. And I, I had forgotten he was with the Packers for six years. That makes the Eagles situation even worse because <laughs> he obviously had a lot of, you know, good years left. Yeah. I mean, yeah, six, six more years, um, had an incredible career, 13 time pro bowl, three time NFC defensive player of the year, hall of famer for both the Packers and the Eagles. Yeah, the accolades for Reggie White are, are, are almost countless, and one of the one of the best players ever in NFL history. And uh, who knows what could happen with Jerome Brown? But I thought this documentary kind of captured those two guys really well, and I learned a lot of things uh, along the way for sure. And I thought this was well done, and and definitely an interesting. Like this isn't one that I would normally just pick out, Mike, to watch, but I'm glad we did. Yeah, me too. And if you guys, if for those of you who are younger, when I think of Jerome Brown. I think of a slightly more athletic Warren Sapp. That's a good if, comparison. Same yeah. kind of attitude, and attitude in a good way. I mean, you know, kind of edge to him. That's what I think of, like the ability to play on the outside a little bit more than maybe a Warren Sapp because he's a little Warren Sapp is really quick and and, and for his size as well. But yeah. that's what I think of. And then, uh, hey, that ninety one thing, Ben, that ninety one 
season, the first season with Kotite when Buddy Ryan got fired, their defense was number one against the pass and number one against the run. Have you yeah. ever heard of that before? Number one overall. No, I, I, no. I, I can't remember a defense that I remember where it was number one um, against the rush and pass. Pretty pretty wild, yeah. I, I, I don't know how many times that's happened. Um because yeah, that's that's very odd. You're really really good at one or the other, and you could be pretty good at both. But to rank first in both is is uh, you would think the record would have been better with those numbers too, Mike. To be honest with you. Yeah, and uh, you know one Reggie White, right? The things that stick out to him, he has so many identifiable traits, right? The deep voice, the nickname Minister of Defense, mm -hmm. the number ninety two. And lastly, the no sleeve, no gloves, just tape on the fingers look yeah, is such an intimidating look, especially when you're in like Green Bay and it's freezing out or Philly and it's freezing out. Yep. And you're playing on that turf in, in Philadelphia <laughs> where it's freezing and it's hard and it's not good quality. And you got Reggie White out there, no sleeves, huge, no gloves, tape on the fingers coming right at you. Just, just throwing you around the field if you're an offensive lineman. Yeah, that's intimidating. No question. Um, yeah, just all around, pretty cool to watch. And I thought it was, was Phil Simms that said, hey, you know, Reggie White's a guy that could have been like the head of the NFLPA. Um, that's the kind of person he was and how, how well-respected and well-liked he was. Like that's, that's the kind of future he could have had where it had a huge impact on the game well beyond what he did on the field. Yeah, you command – when you're a guy like Reggie White, when you could command the room among other football players, like you're the guy amongst the room like that with all alpha males, that's the kind of guy you want leading anything. Yep. So football life, Reggie White and Jerome Brown, it was the second topic that they covered in this uh, long-running series that NFL Films, NFL Network produces, and one that we highly recommend. You can find it on YouTube. Just search for it, and uh, it'll come up. Maybe we'll put a link in our, our show notes too, Mike, for it. But either way, enjoy going back to this. We'll be doing more documentary recaps as we go. If there's one you want us to watch um, to chime in on, we'd, we'd love to hear from you to send it to us. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Shoot us a message on Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Rate and review. Subscribe to the podcast wherever it is you listen on YouTube or on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, any of those. We'd appreciate it, and we'll uh, we'll have a lot more content to come. So, Mike, thanks, man. Enjoy this one. Same here, Ben. We'll see you guys next week.